I'd like to welcome everybody to our panel on IoT design challenges. My name is Rich Nass, and I am with Open Systems Media. I've been in this industry for a very long time. I know these guys pretty well. I probably know many of you in the audience as well. Um, we're here to have a fun-filled 45 minutes, see if we can get a little argument going with, with, with these guys. So here's what, what we'll be doing over the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'm going to ask each of the guys to introduce themselves and explain what their contribution is to IoT design challenges. Basically, explain why uh, we invited them to be on the panel, what their expertise is. Um, I'll ask a few questions to get it rolling, and then we want to take your questions. That's the object of, of this session. We want to get your questions answered, so uh, we, we really want you to ask them. These are the topics we will likely be discussing over the next 45 minutes. Anything is fair game, but I think this will probably cover what we'll be looking at. And these guys are experts in these areas, so feel free to ask anything, anything to do with any of this stuff. So we have six panelists, and we only have 45 minutes, so we want to get through this pretty quickly. I've asked each of the guys to speak for maybe two minutes and explain why they're here. So they were supposed to go in alphabetical order. It's very clear they were not able to do that. So <laughs> we're off to a, a rough start to begin with. But we'll start with Tom, who is on the end. See, I got it right. I didn't know whether you went company or name. So it <laughs> doesn't matter because Z and B. Hi, I'm Tom Perducci. I'm director of platform product management for Zebra Technologies. And you guys might know Zebra Technologies because we're a hardware company. We make barcode printers. and. Through our recent acquisition of Motorola Enterprise Systems, we have handheld scanners, Android uh, devices, and things like that. But I don't work with any of that stuff. I work in the IoT group. And the IoT group at Zebra is about four years old. I was like employee number three of that group or something like that. And we set out to try to do an IoT platform not just for Zebra devices, but for all devices. And it's a tough order. I mean, I mean talk about IoT challenges. There's a lot of things that we've learned in the last four years about that, not just you know the typical, gee, what about security and things like that, but how do you make a device agnostic platform? So that's, that's the sort of stuff that we've worked on for quite a while and happy to talk about with you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next, we have Bill Flynn. We are, we are kind of in order. So far, so good. So far, so good. If you guys move around real quick. Um, so hi, I'm Bill Flynn. I'm uh, Vice President of Engineering and Innovation from uh, Vitek Videocom. Uh, we do uh, pretty much everything around a video camera, um, except for the camera itself. So the tripods you see in the room, the batteries, the chargers, teleprompters, that kind of stuff. If you watch TV today, there is a very good possibility that we brought that to you. Um, in this position and in other positions that I've worked in, I've been involved in IoT kinds of stuff, um, starting back when Renesis did, the, um, did their Zigbee uh, kit. I was the beta site, the North American beta site for that. And um, some of the challenges that we ran into were, beyond the security, were things like trying to get Zigbee to work, these little 802.15.4 radios to work in a stainless steel lined room um, and to go through uh, one foot thick um, concrete walls in England, right? The, the, the restaurants there are, are built vertically, and so you're trying to go through steel and concrete, and, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's not a lot of fun. So, um, so from there to now at Vitech, we're doing um, uh, IoT kinds of things with around the batteries used in a hospital, um, and, and, and doing fleet management. So that's my stuff. Very good. And I don't know what it says, but our, our host was not able to put himself in alphabetical order. Sorry but. about that. Uh, Ken Krieg, I'm Director of Systems Engineering for the IoT Business Unit at Renesis, and uh, I'm probably here because um, my VP realized that my background runs from little tiny 8-bit micros and sensor systems all the way up to data analytics, uh, some fairly serious stuff that I did at LAM Research in uh, preventative maintenance and predicting when uh, semiconductor tools will go down on the line. Um, to a number of other industries where um, I did uh, big data and uh, machine learning and uh, through it all, a lot of connection of sensors wireless and wirelessly. Okay, thank you. We have Peter Semelhack. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to the panel. My name is Peter Sumlach. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Bug Labs. We're a software company that makes tools for building applications for IoT. Um, I think the reason I was invited is we have, uh, we think is a unique way of looking at IoT. We call it social machines. And it came out of our work with customers where, and I'm also here to, to combat this idea that IoT is just M to M version two, because um, it's really not, I think. Social machines implies there's a lot of ways you can use sort of those types of technologies to not just save money, but make money. And there's lots of business models and new things that are happening with respect to uh, retailers and you see smart home and so on, where it's not, you know, it's not your typical M to M type of arrangement. So, so our, uh, our feeling is that um, we help customers with exploring these options. We call social machines. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I wrote a book called Social Machines. If you drop by the exhibit, uh, exhibit hall, we have them there. So, uh, that's my story. Very good. Next we have Andrew Thomas. Hi, my name is Andrew Thomas. I'm the CEO of Skynet. Uh, we are the communication people. We, you, you make software, middleware that works in, a, in industrial systems, industrial plants, and also moves that data up to cloud systems, allowing those, those plants to interact with one another, to interact with uh, tiny systems, to interact with users, uh, analytical systems, and we are part of the uh, the IoT. I'm part of the IoT panel here today because of our work in embedded systems, where we actually make an embedded system that looks like an industrial um, industrial application or industrial component. The idea being that machines in the IoT are not just little things; they are also big things. They they range from devices that have uh, five data points that uh, change every five seconds to devices that have 10,000 data points that change 10 times a second. And our job is to make sure that we can communicate all of that information in real time around the world. And that, I think, is the real promise of the IoT. Very good. And last but not least, we have Joe Zalaker. Zara? Hello, I'm Joseph Zalaker. I am the uh, Director of Technical Marketing for Aero Electronics. Um, in my capacity here, kind of uh, at the panel, you know, our, our mission at Aero was really how do we simplify the design, development, and deployment of Internet of Things applications. And, and where Aero, I think, is uniquely positioned and, and what we're able to provide to our customers is the ability to service all the needs from the sensing elements, embedded processing, secure communications, middleware, apps, and even into the data store. And as you think about, you know, holistic IoT problems, it's more than just getting you know, information off an edge device. It's actually moving it up into business systems. Very good. Okay. A um, little bit of the ground rules. Um, it's an open discussion. We can talk about anything we want with respect to IoT. There's nothing that's off limits. We do not discuss any trade secrets because we have not signed any NDAs here. And we'll openly discuss problems we have encountered and how we solve them. Okay. Um, so who's holding the mic? Peter, okay, so you go first. Um, <laughs> this is a question for everybody. What is the single most difficult design challenge somebody faces? Put yourself in the, in the position of the design engineer. What is the single biggest challenge that he faces? So I speak from uh, experience. Uh, my company, Bug Labs, we actually started off as an IoT hardware systems company. And we end up as a software company, so that tells you something. Um, so the answer, I think, is fairly straightforward. IoT is a system delivery. It's not a software delivery. It's not a hardware delivery. It's not a network communications delivery. It's all of those things working together. And I'm a software engineer, and the reason, one, of the re one of the reasons we had a problem with our initial mission was that I had no appreciation for how hard hardware actually is. You guys are hardware people, so you are laughing. Um, hardware is hard, you know, and, that's, and that's for real. And I think what we say, we speak to a lot of VCs, a lot of entrepreneurs, Kickstarter folks, and, and I think if you're a software person coming into this, you really have no appreciation for things like atoms. You know? In the software world, you don't ever have a shortage of if-then loops, right? But you may have a shortage of Wi-Fi chips, and you can't make your shipment delivery. So there's all these things that hardware that software folks don't understand. The same is true in the opposite direction. And then when you have your software and your hardware and you want it to communicate, is it in real time? Is it periodic? Is it peer-to-peer? -peer? Is it hub and spoke? All these things. What your customer wants is a working system. 
a whole working system. And if you think about like Nest, right, they did a great job of making everything work together. So whether your business is retail or enterprise, whoever's giving you the check wants a working system, and that's everything working together. So if you're putting something together that's going to have that kind of demanding customer, you better have somebody on your team who understands systems as a whole. And I think in my experience in working <coughs> with others, that's by far the biggest challenge and why guys like Arrow are helpful because they have those folks on staff. Pass the mic in whichever direction you want. But before you do that, I, you, you, you raised a good point. I'd just like a show of hands. Who considers themselves a software engineer? Okay, and how about a hardware engineer? And a systems engineer? Okay, it's like a third, a third, and a third. Okay. You got the mic. Great. So if I was taking a look at it, and I would kind of echo a little bit on what Peter's saying, although maybe taking a little bit of a different tack, one of the largest things that we run across is the fact that a lot of people already have systems already deployed in the field or equipment. They may have some form of connectivity. It could go back, you know, 10, 20 years, port server type stuff, wired communication. And what they want to actually do is get these disparate systems kind of up and running and kind of connected together. And again, if, if we're talking about IoT and it's a new deployment with new systems, new hardware, everything else, it's very easy to go deliver that, drop it off, install it at the customer site. But when you have uh, equipment and services and systems from various uh, manufacturers all around the globe already installed and you're trying to put together a unified system, that's where we see a lot of the challenges. How do we get these disparate systems that have been deployed in the field from a legacy perspective, add you know, new connectivity, um, and business intelligence uh, to those type of applications? That's one of the largest things that we actually work with. Well... I'm going to say it because no one else has yet. Uh, the answer to all questions is security. <laughs> and that's the reality. Get, getting your customer to trust you has been the number one problem that we've had. We, we put in front of them a good security solution. We put in front of them a good communication solution, something that is going to save them money or make them money. And they look at us and they say, well, but, but can I trust it? Is it secure? Is it secure enough? What happens to my data? What happens if there's a break-in? And the reality is that people are scared right now about the IoT. We see the, uh, um, all, over the, all over the Internet there are examples of people breaking into systems. All over the Internet there are examples of people responding with uh, what I would call hysteria about things that are really quite um, open to mitigation. And we need to have a more open and a more intellectual conversation, I think, about security so that people will understand what they do get, what they don't get, where their risks are, where their trade-offs are, rather than just screaming security and, and immediately dropping the idea altogether. So when your customer says, don't let go of the mic yet, when your customer says, how do I know I can trust you, what's the answer? Well, the answer is, well, how much trust do you need? The re the security is not a black and white thing. Security is a continuum, and it, it's a trade-off between what your risks are, how, you know, how big a risk is your worst case scenario, uh, what's the likelihood of that happening, um, and what's the payoff for the system that you're going to get. If you can't stand, the, can't stand the risk in order to get the payoff, then you don't go with it. But at the same time, there are lots of things that we can do to minimize risk. And that's what we have to do. That's what we have to talk to our customer about is how we go about minimizing that. Okay. <laughs> the question was, how do you quantify that for a customer? <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants to say other things besides security here. I know I, I, know I opened Pandora's box, but uh, how do you quantify security risk? You don't. It's a conversation with the customer. It really is about identifying the customer's needs and goals, the, uh, the degree to which they are, they are concerned about uh, both their process and their information, and, uh, and explaining the the mechanisms by which we uh, uh, mitigate risk. And it's up to the customer to make that decision whether they're willing to accept that. It's not a quantified thing is, is as much as it is an educational thing. And it's very application driven. There's some data you don't care about and there's other data you really care about. Well, yeah, if you're, if you're Coca-Cola and you're trying to run a, a remotely monitor a plant, a bottling plant, 
the production information might be interesting to Pepsi Cola if they get hold of it, but it's not life threatening. It's not crucial to your to your plant or to your uh, business. But if you put the Coca Cola secret formula on the internet, then that's a little more crucial, and that's a different set of risks. Yeah, I, I, if I might jump in and do my portion. Um, jump in. I was going to say the same exact thing: security. <laughs> um, and and there are several sessions this week that are going to talk about. IoT security, but I think a lot of them um, are focused on one direction, which is I have my device, I want to make sure that nobody can, um, that, my, that when I send out data, it's secure, right? That it can't be read, that kind of a thing. But there's there's a, a different aspect to security sometimes, and, and the, in the fields I've been involved in, which are the food industry and, um, and, and the medical care industry, um, in, in, in medical care, they don't want my IoT device on their network <laughs> unless it's HIPAA compliant, right? And in the restaurant industry, they don't want my device in a KFC or a McDonald's unless it's PCI compliant because there's financial, there's credit card information on that same network. And getting the restaurants or the hospitals to set up a separate network just for my device has been a massive challenge. They don't want to do it, and, and they almost don't care how much benefit this thing brings the cost of auditing me and ensuring my compliance and and um, and explaining to their board of directors how my little tiny hand sanitizer thingy or whatever my battery thing allowed access to a patient's data uh, they're, they're not really interested in that and so um, we've fallen back a number of times to make our own network right cellular modems or whatever which work really well in those stainless steel lined rooms that I was talking about right so so for me, and, and the engineers that um, have been working for me, right, they're, they're really smart software engineers, really great hardware engineers, but then they come up against HIPAA compliance and PCI mm -hmm. compliance, and, and what do you do about it? And, and so that, that has been our, our biggest challenge. Do you have a non-security response? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to say security, but <laughs> I'll fall back on the other one, the other big elephant in the room that has little to do with the devices or whatever, and that is privacy. And the security thereof. How do you, my, one of the biggest challenges, and this is certainly for all the devices in the home and all the IoT stuff that's going to be in the home and your car, <coughs> how do you control the information that's going to be collected by that? How do you present to the user uh, a way of choosing which, you know, like the, the iPhone. Uh, today, location services suddenly turned off my iPhone. So I turn on location services and I go, wait a minute, I don't want all that other stuff. I've got to turn off that, turn off that, turn off that, turn off that. Can you imagine when there's 50 devices running around your home and each one is providing a slightly different thing and maybe you don't want... Uh, this to be disseminated, and this you do, that's going to be a big design challenge. Um, so there's the other elephant in the room, in my opinion. Um, security is very important. Uh, recently, The Economist ran a, uh, a special series on IoT, and uh, they started the section on security by saying, pay up or the refrigerator gets it. <laughs> and frankly, th look, that's, that's not too far-fetched. How many of you know about the ransomware with the Synology disk stations? Not that many. Okay. So somebody put malware on the net that basically um, locked up people's, you know, whatever they had, 4 terabyte, 5 terabyte Synology disk stations, off-the-shelf things you can buy from Amazon. And basically what showed up instead when they went to their web browser was send this amount of money via Bitcoin to this address and will unlock your disk station. So, that's you know, an IoT huh? That's not an IoT problem. It becomes an IoT problem when that's your refrigerator. It is an IoT problem. We did an article uh, very recently about. Uh, okay, well, I'll, okay, then I'm going to argue that the IoT has been around forever, and we just didn't have the funny name for it before. IoT has been around a very long time. Cloud computing has been around a very long time. Okay, don't be blowing up my session here, okay? Welcome in there, man. Welcome in, Rich. I think in your definition of IoT, I think IoT is a concept. IoT is not a market. I hear you. 
I was asked what's my definition of IoT, and I think IoT is, depends on who you are. IoT is not a it's not a thing. It's a concept. It's a it's not a product. It's, it's not even a market. Um, if you talked about a bunch of doctors who are trying to come up with a device for juvenile asthma, IoT is that device. You know, it's a device that connects to the network. If you talk to a carrier, IoT is HVAC systems. It's not a thing, right? And I think the reason why I'm, I'm pointing that out is, and I don't want to bring up the security word again because it's a black hole, is that security very much has been an issue for decades. And a lot of what we're talking about now is not new. And I think there's a very emotional reaction to it um, that we have to get through, clearly. Um, I don't particularly care if someone hacks my refrigerator. I think there, one of the things I like to go back to is how many people use credit cards on the internet, right? Everybody in this room. 15 years ago, there was a huge hullabaloo about saying, oh, that, maybe it was 20 years ago, whatever, a long time ago. Remember all the worry about, oh, don't put your credit card on the internet. No. Now, I don't even check. I just, I'm, yeah, I put it in. You know, I don't even check if it's HTTPS. Who cares, you know? I think there are other ways of getting around security that we're going to have to deal with, but I don't think necessarily, um, I would argue that it's, it is an issue. I don't think it's a huge design challenge right now. Okay, I have two things about that. Sure. First, if somebody hacks your refrigerator, you do care. Why is it, okay. Okay, because that's the entree into all the other devices that are on your network. So everything just became public. Like what? And, how's and my, how's my food gone? gone? <laughs> how, how, hack my suppose, suppose that same <coughs> controller... You need the microphone. The you need the, <laughs> no, because that goes out into your network. I think we're imagining things. Where all your banking information is held. Absolutely. Okay. For sure. Anyway. Okay. My One turn? more biggest design challenge. One, wow. Okay. I don't know where to begin. Uh, first, first of all, uh, first of all I, I think the IoT is very easy to define. It's hooking stuff up to the internet. That's what it is. And by the way, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's been around forever doing that. But uh, so the biggest design challenge, I I agree with everything that was said. Ditto. Great. Wonderful. But I think the bigger design, if you're really talking about the IoT, and you guys are, if imagine you're building a piece of hardware, and you want to connect it to the internet. As far as the IoT is concerned, the most important thing is that you get people to use that hardware. I, you actually want them to actually hook it up, right? And until we get to the point where it's, you're going to be able to package up something and give it to someone, they're going to be able to integrate it, you're stuck with a one-off solution. You're stuck with my custom design that I hook up to the Internet and I write an API for, which, by the way, has been around forever, for a long, long time. That's not the IoT to me. To me, the IoT is making that ubiquitous making it so that you can get to those 50 billion devices on the internet that everybody, you know, that bandies around that term. Because if everything's a custom design, it's not going to be 50 billion anytime soon. Right? So the hard part is how do you actually do that in a way which is uh, stable and reliable and secure and interoperable? So it really needs to be, you got to have all these devices that can hook up with all these different cloud services because you can't have an island. You can't have your own thing here, uh, at least not anytime soon, because we got to get from all custom designs, everything hooked up, proprietary API, which was the beginning of the world 20 years ago, whatever, to Nirvana, which is 50 billion devices. They're not all going to have their own API. It's just not going to happen. So that's the hard part. I thought you were going to say just buy a Renaissance Synergy platform and all your <laughs> problems are solved. <laughs> Uh, okay. Quick question. Go ahead. So on, the, on what you mentioned now, is it, isn't the web what's going to unite all the stuff that's underneath? Okay, the question is, isn't the web the one thing that's, that will unite all the of these The web is the things? plumbing. The web is the wires. Yeah, everything's hooked up, but it doesn't necessarily work the way you want it to. Oh, what I meant is everything underneath could be different, right? It's the presentation and the access at the top layer. Is that what we are going for, or everything has to be uniform at the lower layer? Well, that's that's a huge discussion there. The, the the question was, you know, what? How do you how do you separate, you know, presentation from connectivity and things like that? And you, that's a very very tough decision, right? And everybody's pushing their own set of standards, and until everybody uses them, they're they're not a standard, right? So, so that's that's a big discussion. But you do need to have some interoperability, which means people have to eventually be using 
very, very similar components, some with more reliability and more depth than others, but you're going to have to have some sort of standardization. Okay. Go ahead. I have a quick comment uh, about IoT in general. I'm a member of uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force. I've been working on uh, IoT since before it was called IoT. It was called Smart Objects. And from the Engineering Task Force, you know, some of the challenges that we always see on IoT is obviously security, access, power, standards, regulation. And one of the comments where you say we have to care. Yes, you have to care because there is an FTC report that is very recent where the Federal Trade Commission is coming with some potential regulations for the IoT market. Um, from the engineering side, we don't like that much. So we don't like regulation. So we will have to self-regulate and try to come up with standards for security, for access, for power, for ubiquity. So those are the challenges of IoTs, not just one challenge. You, you threw out a lot of we's and they's. Oh, yeah. And I'd, does anybody have a comment about that? Like, who, who's the we's and the they's? <coughs> Do we need regulation? So, so again, as, as you looked at it, and the gentleman up front was talking about there needs to be standardization on networking protocol, whatever else. When you take a look at the wealth of devices that are out there, the various business needs, the costs associated with it, the term that the device is going to run, you know, there isn't a one-size-fits-all with respect. And I'll just, I'll just single out maybe just network connectivity. Um, there just isn't, you know, currently today. And again, as we move forward, we continue to see new and emerging standards, you know, coming, whether it's something like Sigfox, LoRa, and others. And again, the industry continues to evolve, it keeps looking for new and better ways in which to kind of do the networking piece. And I'm only talking about just that part. Will there be a unified, one standard fits all? You know, again, working for a $24 billion hardware company, I'm not seeing it anytime in the future. But what about when you start to get into applications like automotive? where these are mission critical things. Do we want the government to be setting some of these standards? I would say in that case, I would say no. I would leave it up to the industry and the um, technologists to provide to us best in class technology that continues to drive the innovation forward. You know, what was, you know, let's say hypothetically from a cellular perspective, if we thought that 2G back then was kind of the de facto standard, you know, now we look at the demands on the infotainment systems on the vehicles where, you know, LTE and others, you know, are more of the standards today. I think we just let innovation ride. And, you know, get those that uh, come up with, you know, good ideas. And innovation will always kind of trump everything else. And you saw the Jeep that was hacked into. And that's okay. Just let the industry do its thing. I, I don't know necessarily if government regulation would have caught that. I mean, it's, you know. But it would, would have given us something to point a finger at. Well, I think Jeep, Jeep is that finger, so. I think the Jeep is a really bad example. Because the Jeep was based on industrial automation protocols. That's the main issue, it's a bad example. Okay. Fair point. Anybody else have a question before I go on? Got a whole room full of people. Somebody's got a question. Go ahead. So, um, a big application out there is small sensors and industrial application and uh, they want to the customers want to see their data it's real simple M to M stuff we need a real simple way I mean Exosite does this a lot where you can just push stuff to the data and you can actually go look with it for it with an API but it's not it's not it's way I want to put data through some standard protocol and I want to go see that data in the database and that's all I want to do I don't want you to tell me how to make my API and all that kind of stuff I want access to my data is there a question in there? Yeah, is there something like that? Where are we headed with that? Okay, there you go. You get the first swag. <laughs> on a cloud that I can see my data for my customers. Well, then you should come by my booth. <laughs> or mine. <laughs> is that why you got the thing? Would you repeat the question, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what you were saying is that for you, the benefit of IoT is being able to take a thing, whatever your thing is, publish the data to the Internet, and be able to see it remotely in real time. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, but I don't have API <coughs> right. satisfy my customer's needs. Right. And so in there, I think, there's a couple of key points that I feel like also are driving the Internet of Things today, is that, as you can tell by these conversations immediately, is, is that the IoT is very complex, right? Depending on where you're looking, if it's enterprise, consumer, is it something for your own use, or is it something you're going to sell millions of? 
it's a complex world. Um, but in this particular case, it sounds like what's necessary is something very simple. And our whole approach, and I don't want to talk about bug labs, but I think in general, you're seeing this, this real drive for simplicity. You've got Google Apps versus Microsoft Office. You have Salesforce.com versus Siebel. You have all these enterprises now using very simple systems. And the reason for that is because complexity is so passe. Like, no one wants complexity. They want something that's simple. They want to use it right now, like Dropbox. And so we came up with our solution because of that exact problem, which is I just want to put my thing on the Internet and see it and then visualize the information and then go from there. I may not know exactly how it's going to look a year from now, but I just want to get it out there and play with it, give access to my customers in a secure way. So I think the answer is yes, there are. And we're not the only people who do this, by the way. There's lots of other companies. You mentioned Exosite. Um, so I think there is this movement towards providing simple-to-use tools for people to get started and then going from there. So. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, the, the issue is providing for all the use cases you know, at, with, a, with a set of standards and then not complicating the simple ones, right? That's the, that's the thing you want to get at. And I think there are, there are ways to do that. That's not really hard. It depends on the details about exactly, you know, what your hardware is and what your degrees of freedom are and what your security needs are. Maybe you don't have any. I don't care. I just want to put my temperature sensor up on the Internet. I just want to read it, and I don't care if anybody else reads it, right? That could be the case, and there are ways to do that. I think the hard part is when you try to get all of the use cases into one, into one stack. Like, oh, I, this does everything, and it never does, right? So that's the issue. But I, I do think there's, there's pl tons of ways to do what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I'd like to address that one as well. Um, there is a first mile problem here with, uh, with collecting your data and putting it up on the Internet. You have a device already in existence. Uh, you mentioned industrial systems, for example. So maybe it speaks OPC, maybe it speaks Modbus, maybe it speaks any one of 300 other industrial protocols. And you need to be able to get that up to a cloud system that is definitely not going to speak one of those protocols. So you have the first mile problem. You need to be able to collect that data somehow. The, one of the challenges is how do you do that without having to write custom applications? And the answer is, well, you tie into existing, um, in existing standards. You tie into standards like OPC or, or like Modbus. And you, you get an off-the-shelf component that you put down on your local area network that acts as a gateway, as a bridge between that industrial protocol and the cloud system that you're targeting. So that's part one of the question. Part two of the question is that saying, I just want to see my data on the internet is not necessarily a sufficient definition of the problem. Because if you've got a device that is generating, uh, generating information at 10 hertz, let's say, which is not uncommon in an in industrial system, then trying to gateway that to an application that is effectively a uh, uh, sort of an internet uh, database surrounded by a REST API isn't going to work. You're not going to get 10 hertz data up to that database. And you're not going to be able to see your process dynamics when you go to look at it. You're only going to be able to see after the fact information. So we need more than just, I need to get my data on the internet. We need, I need to get my data that's in a standard format that is local to a format that is visible on the internet at a rate that does not substantially diminish the quality of my experience. And that's, I, that's what we're trying to do. And I think that there, that really is the goal. Just, just one thing I will of. interject. <laughs> it's possible my colleague might be overcomplicating your problem. <laughs> it's just possible. <laughs> right? What if it's once a day? If it's, uh, if it's once no, a day virtually. I, I'm just saying that's, that's a possibility. You, you yeah. can make a paper airplane and you can throw it, and that's good enough at once a day. I agree. I mean, we, we, my company makes batteries and chargers. I mean, you, you can see them around here. And how often do you need to see the data coming out of your charger, right? It takes three hours to charge a battery, so every hour, right? And how many bytes of data is it? 20, right? And so, not a plug for you, but I had, a, I had an intern take our charger that was already Wi-Fi equipped, and in a day, we had it up on, on, the, on the web, tweeting away, and uh, done by a, a, a junior in college, right? That quick. And, and if I could remember the address, we could go look at it right now. I mean, it was that fast and that simple. And it was super secure. <laughs> <laughs> but again, but again, from a security standpoint, that particular application doesn't require it because you can't control it. Now, unless there's all kinds of holes in your thing that would allow somebody to punch through your stuff down into my stuff and then woohoo, 
you controlled my charger, good for you. You know, now go play a video game or something. I, I, you know, I don't know. But, okay. but then you get, into, you get into the hospital scenarios and things like that, and, and it's not that simple, right? The food service, right? You, you start cooking food wrong. Um, you don't care if they control your refrigerator, but the average cost of a loss for a restaurant when a refrigerator fails to work is on the order of $10,000, right? It's $10,000 worth of food in a, in a standard KFC or a McDonald's. And when the refrigerator stops functioning, gone. And the lost business, right? Because now all of a sudden I gotta replenish that stock and I can't service my customers. And or the lawsuit that occurs because I served some of it and it was bad, right? So maybe you don't care if they control your refrigerator, but my customers did and do, right? And, and so it, it, it is a very, it is a spectrum, right? Now who cares about my charger, but I absolutely care about my refrigerator. Very good. Yep. Your question? Question for you guys. So, um, part of the, I guess, what makes the Internet of Things called the Internet of Things is because it connects to the Internet. Right? Otherwise, it's a question. Question. Oh, this is a sick thing. I'm going right. to so repeat the question. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the different communication mechanisms, whether it could be Bluetooth, um, whatever the stuff <coughs> is, like how it's going to evolve in the future? Because um, right now it seems like it's. It, it is kind of all over the place. So the question is, would you please discuss the communications protocols for the IoT? Yeah, and I'd like to know the panel's thoughts on, on this as well, because I do have a, a concern that as we begin to deploy more and more IoT devices, and more and more of them are um, Bluetooth or Zigbee or Wi-Fi, pretty soon the air gets full, right? In a hospital, again, back to the hospital example, um, the, the average hospital has 250 beds, right? And, and the average bed is gonna have between, I don't know, 20, and 20 to 50 devices, um, sensors, and that's not including all the other areas that aren't around the bed. So pretty soon, the air gets full. Now what? So just a comment on that from, again, from a small $24 billion company that probably services most of uh, your communications and networking needs. The thing that we see is, you know, there, you know, every single, almost every week, something new is on the marketplace. Somebody's coming to us who's developed the next level chip, does the next greatest thing. You know, when you look at all this sort of stuff, I mean, you, know, you talk about this whole Internet of Things and building applications. You know, starting with the business problem is really the kind of the place to go, and I know we're talking about hardware here, but if you can only afford X amount of dollars in terms of your wireless sensors, it's going to dry you to certain technologies. Um, you know, we're going to have this need that we're going to have to have personal area network local area network, wide area network, and even you know longer terrestrial satellite type you know, mechanisms. Again, I don't see the number of protocols getting less. I see it getting a lot more in terms of moving forward. We get asked this an awful lot, right? What is, you know, which technology should I really pick and choose for my application? Well, quite honestly, it depends. And that's my fa you know, favorite sales guy answer, right? It, it depends. Yeah, I don't really like your, I mean, I, I agree with you, but I don't like the answer. I mean, there's so many flavors of every one of those protocols, and then there's, there's all new ones. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like we're in some sort of a situation now where th th these things are new, and we're trying to solve individual problems by trying to come up with different uh, rules and approaches. Is there a need for some sort of discipline that can characterize different kinds of applications and their characteristics and identify the kinds of for instance, the levels of what you might t put intelligence between the device and the cloud, or up the, what, something that would not be one solution for everything, but would be a set of criteria out of which you could select to make the best match for the needs of that application, but in an orderly manner that, that could be written in a book or something like that, not in a cloud. I think the, Before uh, you answer, please paraphrase the question. Um, the, the question, I think, if I'll try to paraphrase is, wouldn't it be nice to have, um, I'll call it an academic approach to the best way to build an IoT application, you know, the best practices maybe, if you will. Um, I think no one would disagree that that would be an awesome thing to have. The question is, where does it come from? Um, and I think there are plenty of, you know, MIT does a lot of things in IoT. I don't, I don't remember ever reading something which was such like the, the holy grail of IoT, but I think you have companies like Qualcomm who are trying to put together a fabric of, of 
device identifiers and so on. You have Google now with their Weave and so on. Like, so big companies are trying to address it at the platform level. So they'll say, you know, if everybody, if everybody just adopts this, the world will be a wonderful place, right? Just use my <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we're all, you know, <laughs> That's right. I think we're all spoiled in a way because if you think about um, Mark Zuckerberg could come up with this great idea for social networking um, and have it go, quote, viral um, very quickly because we were all, you know, he was standing on the shoulders of all of this work. We all had Wintel machines running the same networking standards across, you know, everything was standardized. We all basically had the exact same operating environment so that one thing could go. And it's a wonderful thing for an entrepreneur to be able to do that. But in IoT, there is no Wintel. There is no monopoly that sort of everybody has. It's sort of true in IoT. I mean, uh, in iPhone and Android, sort of. But in IoT, if you're talking about, you know, trying to come up with a lingua franca for everything, it's going to be hard. Way in the back there. You. Yes. <laughs> have a really, really good update strategy. I would say there's no answer. If you guys have an answer to that. Lots and lots of flash. That's a great question, because he's talking about a medical device. So if that fails, somebody dies. So what's the answer? So you're talking about you have to speak into the mic, hardware. Ken. You're talking about choosing hardware for that device. Yeah, first, first, first cause is hardware, then software, right? So what's the most ubiquitous standard right now? Yeah. So um, I, I mean. As a personal choice, I would go with ubiquity. Um, Ethernet's going to be around a very, very long time. Um, Bluetooth is going to be around. It may not be suitable for everything. It's going to be around a long time um, because it's in everybody's phone. Uh, Wi-Fi is going to be around a very long time. Um, beyond 10 years, who knows? But, you know, 5 to 10 years, yeah, you're probably safe choosing the thing that's everywhere right now. Okay, I, th I think it's a. <laughs> well, but 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 even but even but even the wires, right? So if you deploy a device today and it's and it's um, you know, 100 megabit, right? Five years from now, that device is still talking 100 megabit, and we're out there at I don't know terabit, right? The IT guy is going to come along and go, get your slow piece of junk off of my network because you're sucking up with your tiny little packets, you're sucking up huge amounts of effective bandwidth, right? So. How do, you, how do you deal with that, right? And the answer is, tell them they have to buy a new one, all right? So, <laughs> right, because, yeah, I mean, turn your product, yeah, you got to obsolete it. Sorry, your IT guy said I got to get out, so, yeah, I, really, I don't know. Unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> uh, that was a really good question, but, and I, I, I think these guys will be around for a while if you want to speak to them individually. I'd like to thank our panelists. Um, doing a really good job being good sports. And thank you for your questions. Thank you.